I'm pretty fired up to talk about tobacco harm reduction because tobacco itself has impacted my entire life. Like most of you, I have family members that smoke. Growing up, I remember everybody around me smoking. Now, some of those people quit, uh, some of them tried, and some of them didn't. And unfortunately, because of the death and disease associated with smoking cigarettes, they're no longer with us. So this entire thing is pretty personal to me. Now at its core, the idea of tobacco harm reduction just made sense to me. Obviously, the simplest way to reduce harm is to eliminate it altogether, just quit smoking. And some people try to do that, but just quitting cold turkey, well, it's really difficult and not a lot of people can get that done. So there was products, these harm reduction products, things like nicotine gum and patches and pharmaceutical things like Chantix. Those were all created to get people to stop smoking. Now my dad, he's actually one of those people. When I was a kid with a mix of patches and gums and support from our family and even a little bit of candy, he was able to stop smoking completely, but he is a bit of an anomaly. You see the success rate of those products is pretty low. It's about 7%. So for every seven Fred Garretts that tried and quit smoking, there's 93 others that are out there that are still smoking that pack and a half of Marlboros every single day. And here's the even crazier thing. Now, let's say that you're one of those 93 Fred Garretts that wasn't able to quit, but you wanted to give it another shot. The second go round, the success rate is actually lower than 1%. It's closer to zero. So obviously people still wanna quit smoking, but the products that are there just weren't working. So you would think that people would wanna create new products, things to help them a little bit better. And turns out stuff like that exists. You may know it as e-cigarettes or vaping, but it's called nicotine vapor technology. I know, I know. When I say vape or vapor or vape shop, I understand the picture you have in your head. Maybe it's that dude with the gauged ears and just covered in tattoos, or the tech bro that is mumbling about disruption while he leaves a trail of jewel pods on the way to his next meetup. Or maybe it's not a person at all. Maybe you just think of like shadowy, evil, big tobacco that's pulling the strings on this new craze and hooking people to these other products. I know all of those things because at a certain time I thought of myself. And especially after I started this job with Vita News and started talking about tobacco harm reduction, my friends and family, they were honestly a little confused. I had somebody ask me if I was selling cigarettes now. Some of my girlfriend's friends asked if she was cool with me pushing vapes. One of them even said, I thought Dom was a good guy. And I'm not here to complain about what my friends and family are saying behind my back, that's for therapy. But what I am here to do is to talk about how that that's not really the way that the world works. The reality of the situation is it's a lot more nuanced and complex than that. People are not just one thing. And so what I wanted to do is take some time to travel around to the states near where I live to talk to these people, the people that use these products, that call themselves vapors, that own shops and businesses that support their friends and family in their community to see exactly who they were. This is Ron and Deanna Marshall of Montana. Now, Deanna used to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. Every year, she would have what she called her yearly respiratory illness. And about six years ago, it was so bad that she couldn't even take a drag off of a cigarette. So she took some advice from a friend and went down to a gas station and bought a small little disposable vape pen. She used that for 10 days and did not have any cigarettes. But as soon as the illness was gone, she thought she was just going to go right back to smoking. And I picked up a cigarette and I took one puff off it and I said, no, no, this is, no, I'm yeah. staying with this. And after that point, she did not look back. She realized she wanted these products, but at the time, Montana only had two vape shops for 1.1 million people. So after some conversations and some discussions with her husband, Ron, they decided to take a $3,000 loan out against their Jeep and she launched her first business, Freedom Vapes. The response was amazing. See, we had people we had people riding their bikes eight miles to come to our shop. Really? It was it was awesome to see so many people coming in and quitting smoking. Awesome. Now, the median age I think that we had at one point in time, we kind of figured it out, was anywhere from thirty-five to sixty-five. So it was it was really cool to hear people say, Oh, I was on Chantix or you know, and yeah. was, I tried patches, I tried gums, I tried this, I tried that. 
and to have them come in and after you know a couple of weeks go man this works great we'd be fist bumping you know <laughs> yeah let's wait for the next one you yep. know it, it was awesome. it was the best time of my life after a while the business got so big that ron quit his job driving truck they opened a second store in bozeman and then eventually a third because they realized the need for these products was so great, not only in Montana, but outside as well. Idaho's right down the road. We get a lot of out-of-state people that they can't get the product down there because they're so rural. They'll yeah. come up here and get it. How many people have walked through your door and purchased something that helped them stop smoking altogether? Between all three of our stores? Yeah. Thousands. Thousands yeah. of Montanans. Easy. Yeah. Easy. And I've had senators up here in Helena sit there and stop me in the hallway and go, you're doing a good thing for Montana. So I asked them who their customers were. Who are the vapors of Montana? We have doctors and nurses, uh, ambulance, EMTs, firemen, police officers. I mean, mm -hmm. Board of Health members, we have all kinds of people that are our customers. People think, you know, well, yeah, you're a vapor, you know. Well, I'm an EMT, you know, and I'm a vapor, or I'm a health practitioner, I'm a vapor, you know. Yeah. We need more people like that to come forward and go, yeah, it's not just this segment, it's all across the board. So this couple, who was living paycheck to paycheck, found something that helped them both stop smoking. After realizing the power of the products, they wanted to help other people in Montana have the same ability that they did, so they started a business. No shadowy big money pulling any strings, no get-rich-quick schemes, just two people starting a small business in America. We had one come in on his 18th birthday. Really? Um, to quit smoking. He'd already been wow. smoking for a couple years. Um, just found out that his girlfriend was pregnant and he wanted to quit smoking and be a good dad. This is Skip Murray. Much like Ron and Deanna, Skip saw the power of these products herself and so she opened a store in northern Minnesota with her son. But if you were to like estimate how many people that you think, since your shop has been open, that you've helped completely stop smoking combustible tobacco. Do you have any idea what that number would be? Over a thousand. Yeah. You know, it used to be um, just about every day you help somebody quit smoking. Um, it's really sad now, because you're lucky if there's one a month. Why is that? because people no longer believe that vaping is safer than smoking. There's been so much negative publicity, um, a lot of misinformation, um, and it's scaring people away from trying it. So they believe they might as well just keep smoking. And Skip is right. The campaigns warning against the so-called dangers of these products have grown louder and more frequent. Just last year in the United States, we saw how the CDC and the FDA linked the Evoli crisis to vaping even though it has been proven that those lung injuries actually came as a result of something added to black market cannabis e-liquids. But as you know, once a story gets legs, well, it's pretty hard to stop it. And those fears, unfounded as they may be, led to more intense scrutiny. And after scrutiny came more intense regulation. Flavor bans, clean indoor air, tax, um, you name it, they were bringing it at us. One of the justification for the regulations claiming that these products are exactly like tobacco products and therefore should be regulated the same way. However, the owners of these shops, well, they don't agree with that classification. This is something that gets people away from tobacco. Yeah. Uh, call it our enemy if you want to. This, this is what we were doing. I don't believe these products should have been classified tobacco. There's no tobacco in them. Um, yes, there's nicotine. Um, and nicotine is in things other than tobacco. I think they should have gotten their own classification. Um, they're a consumer product. They were invented by somebody who smokes to help people quit smoking. And we're not even allowed to say that because that's a medical claim, but um, it is. It's the consumer solution to the tobacco problem. But unfortunately, the label of a tobacco product has stuck. And with that, came immense regulation from the FDA. You see, the FDA has this thing that they call the PMTA, or the Pre-Market Tobacco Application. Now, this was originally intended to help the FDA stop new tobacco products, or at least get a closer look at them before they hit the shelves. Originally, these applications applied only to things like cigarettes and smokeless tobacco. 
these other products were not included. But because of the intense scrutiny and push from anti-vaping groups, there was a deeming law that was passed in May of 2016, which allowed the FDA to lump all of these products in with things like cigarettes. And even though that deadline was a ways off, there was increased pressure due to the misinformation around the Evoli crisis last year, and it led a judge to set a much sooner deadline for those applications. That was pushed because of COVID, but now it is rapidly approaching, September 9th, 2020. Because of how the FDA determines what a product actually is, yeah. um, the skew inflation is like 13,000% increase. This is Shar Owen, a information technology expert, as well as another small business owner making and selling e-liquids for open system vapor technology. She and her husband realized very early on that most shops are not prepared for the enterprise level requirements being asked of them from the FDA. So they created a way to streamline the process. We're asking these people that are mom and pop shops that probably work off paper receipts to enter the world of enterprise. And all we need is a little help from the FDA. The way that the PMTA works is that small businesses need to submit an application for each SKU or individual product they sell. Now you might think this is simple, maybe a couple dozen applications, but in all reality, each change of a product, each different size, every flavor, that equals a new application. And those numbers can add up pretty quick. These small people are gonna have a problem with is the fact that they have to make, instead of doing their 100 recipes, they have to do closer to five or 6,000 documents for those exact same numbers of recipes. And these applications, well, they're not easy to fill out and they're definitely not cheap. Even with a streamlined process put together by this group of small business owners, it takes hundreds of hours per application. And on top of that, Mitch Zeller of the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products estimated that it could cost a couple hundred thousand dollars per application. And those are things that most small business owners just can't afford. The FDA is under the umbrella of the Health and Human Services. And the secretary of that government agency, Alex Azar, did say that they would provide a streamlined, cost-effective process for small businesses to get through this application period. However, that doesn't quite seem to be the case. Secretary Azar talked about a streamlined, uh, affordable yeah. PMTA process for these small businesses. None of these things have happened. Have you, has the FDA reached out to you at all? No. Because no. This is the group that the FDA should be honed in on to hopefully help. What they're trying to do is say, we're going to make it easy for you, when in fact it is impossible. Yeah. So this lack of clarity from the FDA, the failure to streamline, and the threat of enforcement is causing many businesses to just close up shop early. The Rocky Mountain Smoke Free Association estimated that 14,000 businesses, small businesses, just like Skip's, just like Char's, just like Ron and Deanna's, are going to be forced to close because of the requirements on this application. That's over 160,000 Americans out of work, $24 billion worth of economic activity that disappears. However, it's not just gonna disappear. It creates a vacuum. What is this going to do for like the consumers, for the people that are actually using this? Like, What does this mean to them? It's gonna turn the majority of the industry over to big tobacco. And big tobacco used to be the enemy and they're gonna have the corner on the market because all these small businesses are gonna go away. And those businesses that manage to stay open through this process, well, they're gonna be severely hampered on the products that they have available. And that means less options for those people that are just looking for an option to quit smoking. One of the things that's appealing to people that smoke is that variety. Um, and without the variety, a lot of people say they'll just keep smoking or they'll go back to smoking if they've already quit. And this is why I traveled around the country, to talk to people like Ron and Deanna and Skip and Char, to see that that caricature that we think of when we hear the word vapor, well, that's not the case. It's people like this in small towns and cities all across the United States that are just looking for a way to help their friends, to help their family, to help their community quit smoking. Why should we fight to help people get on something that's better than, than smoking? It shouldn't be a fight.